Um, my name is Wim Lavin, and I'd like to welcome you to our keynote event for uh, tonight. This is part of our ongoing Peace and Justice Studies Association's online conference for 2020. And our conference is made up of three months of programming. Um, and this is featured as part of our October uh, storytelling and narratives for social justice. And um, so before we get started, I just would like to encourage everyone, check out the Peace and Justice Studies Association if you're not familiar with us. Um, we are the raddest people you'll ever meet, um, covering some of the most important and timely um, topics academically and otherwise. Um, we have annual conferences. Uh, virtual is great, but in person's even better. Um, membership's cheap. Um, I'd also encourage you, um, it's not over yet. Uh, we have um, polarization coming up as part of uh, the conference for November. There's a big election next week. Uh, we will be talking about some of the stuff. We have always known that this was gonna be a particularly divisive year with the politics. So talking about polarization should be meaningful to everyone. Um, so check out the conference, you know, free for students. We, it's highly affordable, $25 a month for non-students and it's free for members. So, you know, just become a member and catch some more of the conversations. Um, Tonight's going to be fantastic. We have more fantastic uh, presentations planned. Um, tonight's keynote will be delivered by a friend of mine. And part of the challenge that we've covered in some of the presentations this month um, is about the use of stories and, and the use of other people's stories. And so one of the things I want to say uh, honestly and openly, I did not want to ask Jamil to have to relive his experience. It was actually the profound serendipity that in talking to him ab about my own challenges, it's been very difficult to make friends in Ohio during a global pandemic. Um, and we've had, had some challenges with trying to figure out how to get together and to do so safely. But he told me, he told me that he had a profoundly spiritual need <laughs> to be able to turn his experience um, into something that could help others learn and to help really advance our causes of peace and justice. I took that to the October um, subcommittee, um, my colleagues, Michelle Collins Sibley and Pushpai Ayer were absolutely two huge thumbs up that this is exactly the stuff that we're looking to do and the kind of stories that we're looking to amplify and promote. So let me give a little bit of an introduction um, before you hear the details from our presenter. On the evening of July 28th, it was a Sunday, a family of four adults and five children went to a bike trail. An act of terrorism proceeded to ruin that experience. In this presentation, you will hear about the actions of this terrorist. He shouted profane slurs to disparage them based upon their skin color. He openly mocked the way he believed they prayed and told them he would bury them all in the river. Finally, when his abhorrent behavior did not repel the family, he retrieved a 357 Magnum, he returned, he pointed in the direction of the family and fired two shots over their heads. He confesses that his motivation was to scare the family into leaving. Terrorism is defined as the use or threat of violence against civilians in the pursuit of political, religious, ideological, or social objectives. Dr. Jamil al Wekian and I have known each other since 2012. We were in the same PhD program studying international conflict management. I first worked with him when we presented together on efforts for building peace in contexts of ethnic conflict and intractable conflict. At that conference, I presented on South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. 
a project synthesizing truth, healing, and consequences for race-based violence. Pamela Gobo Madikizela, uh, her encounter with Eugene de Kock, otherwise known as Primeval, who commanded a death squad during apartheid, showcased another clear example of the tension between a need to heal and a need to punish. Reconciliation was not easy. Seven years were added to the already long process before the commission could be completed. Keys in the process were truth and healing. I was hesitant to reach out to Jamil to, about his story, but in recent months he expressed this and it connects so directly to the arc of our experiences together that we have worked on and studied and shared stories about healing from violence and hate. In this presentation, Jamil will tell you about healing and forgiveness. His family, they do not hold grudges. So please welcome Jamil al Wekian. Well, um, thank you so much for uh, for this wonderful introduction. Um, I, I appreciate you as a friend and a colleague that I've known for, for years now. And uh, uh, I would like to share my slides with you. So, so yes, okay. All right. So basically I will be speaking, well, first, good evening, everyone, sorry. Um, and then and I just, I, I just wanna say how wonderful and exciting to see all of you in the audience. Um, to be honest, as I consider what thoughts I might share with you tonight, um, I must admit it is, uh, or I found it, like, I, I must admit that I found it somehow difficult to put towards my, my experience. But uh, before we actually um, get uh, to the serious part of my presentation, I would like to maybe walk you or quickly walk you through my um, uh, journey or the journey of my life uh, prior coming to the US and even in the um, aftermath or basically as I sometimes call it, my non-stop flight, non-stop flight. But I must warn all of you here, um, it, it will be a bumpy ride. So please fasten your seat belts and you might need to hold tight to your um, seats. So um, here's an, an overview of my presentation. I would like to maybe uh, give um, an introduction uh, about my place of origin, early education in Jordan, um, then migrating to the US, uh, education in the US and career. Uh, my personal experience in terms of uh, living, uh, let's say the, 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 the stories, not only one I will be speaking um, about more than one, to be honest, multiple or several incidents that happened to me uh, exemplify hate and, and discrimination uh, toward others. Uh, but I will focus at the major or the most or the most dangerous and the critical one, which is the most violent one in the, in the end. Then I will discuss some of the, um, pro or the process of healing uh, hope for peace and justice in the future. And I will speak about um, the scars that um, remain. So the place of origin, I, origin, I, I was born a few- That's okay. I know I need to do something. I guess it's in decent shape. I mean, that, so, so, that do you, uh, I want to think about that more. But yeah. you can get this white and have like a nice gray. That you mind probably muting yourself if you're not? Thank you. So the place of origin, I, I was born. If you guys look, you can see my slides. If you look here, um, that's uh, where I was born. I was born in this village. It's called Al Faisaliya in Jordan in 1981. It's, uh, um, it's actually used to be called Kfir Al Wukyan or basically the village of Al Wukyan. My last name, it was 
um, named after my tribe's name or my nation. Let's say some people call it tribe, some call it nation. I would call it either one. Um, so in the late 80s, was uh, the name was changed to Al Faisalia. It's only two miles from Mount Nebo, and I assume some of you here probably know Mount Nebo. It's basically um, a Christian holy site or holy place, one of the most most um, of holy places and and um, historic sites for for Christians to visit. And I know it's part of their um, destination when they do. Uh, uh, pilgrimage, which is actually believed to be where uh, Prophet Moses was or uh, buried or died. Um, so I live only two miles from, or this is my town or um, uh, hometown. My early education, um, my early schooling was actually in this school from um, day one till I finished my higher, I mean, my high school. So I went to school and if you look at it now, it's sort of remodeled and colored, but back in the eighties was, I mean, if you look at it, you would say, I mean, how would like students even graduate from like such such school? But you know, when we speak, we are speaking about the third world country. So, and that's uh, uh, where I received uh, my education. And here's, here's the thing, it may sound strange, but when I was a kid, when I was a kid, let's say maybe fifth or sixth uh, grade, I would dream of coming to the US um, to finish my education here. Um, I know like a kid in this age in the middle of nowhere, just thinking about coming to the US and finish higher education in the US. And I still remember that when none of my peers um, was interested in knowing or reading about the US. Um, and most of them would pick maybe um, kids' stories from the school's library. Um, I, I picked a book about the U.S. history. I was, I was fifth or sixth grade. And I was, I mean, this book was translated into Arabic. So I was reading this book. I was like, I was focused and fully uh, attracted to that book. Two of the um, major things that, let's say, um, focused a lot on them. One is the slavery and the relationship between uh, white and black in the, um, during the slavery and the aftermath. And the other topic was um, uh, Christopher Columbus and discovering um, the West. So if you look here, this is a photo of my brother and myself here. Um, I have my binocular on me. And uh, if you look at the background, it is, um, uh, wallpaper in, in our uh, guest room that was in the mid 80s when they would ask me what you want to do when you get older I would say I want to discover the west I want to discover the west and I have my binocular with me as if you know um, because I read I know I, I said about like uh, uh, read about Christopher Columbus and then discovering the west and something like this so it, it sounds like sometimes strange about like to speak about it, but that actually things that happened to me when I was a kid. Um, the other thing that I want to mention, I grew up in a family that um, that is part of one of the largest tribes or nations in that village. So basically a collectivistic society that has specific expectations and demands from any individual who agreed to be part of. We, it's a, just a collectivist society, which is norm in, in this part of the world. My father, uh, that's his picture, he died in 2014, was um, a, a wise man. He used to be a mediator, if I will, or a person who would be the target uh, to reconcile between uh, disputants or conflicting sides. They come up to his place or place um, to, like, to has his uh, assistance to maybe figure out things for them. So growing up around this environment sort of triggered this type of my personality or this part of my personality um, or it inspired me to get, let's say, a formal education in, in conflict resolution and the group reconciliation. So basically the seeds of uh, my current ed education and career was cultivated back then in, in, in the early years of my, my life. Now, um, 
before so so here's the thing in, in jordan when i finished my high school i wanted to go to school there um to i really wanted to do a conflict resolution program but none of the universities in Jordan would offer any conflict resolution program. So I decided to go to my second favorite topic or major, which is psychology. I did my bachelor in psychology and my master's in, in criminology and criminal justice. Um, when I finished my master's, um, I faced, to be honest, um, the decision, should I, now I have the option of coming to the U.S. and finish up my PhD in, in the U.S. or finish my PhD in, in, in Jordan. So sort of like the decision should be made was in 2009, um, either as I mentioned, finish there, my PhD or, or coming to the U.S. Then I decided it was critical. It was just a critical decision to be made. Um, I decided to come to the U.S., um, which was in summer of 2000, uh, 2009, and this is a photo of me of, and two other friends, international students at the at Youngstown State uh, University. And the reason that I came to Youngstown, basically, it's uh, simply a migration chain because I, I I had some family members who lived in in Youngstown, Ohio. And, you know, as if you come from a collectivistic society, you just go because they are expected to provide some help and um, uh, maybe look after you. So I, ca I came to, uh, to Youngstown State University. I finished up my uh, English program. Then um, I started applying for my PhD program. I got accepted at Kennesaw State uh, University at the International Conflict Management Program, where actually I met when, as you mentioned, in 2012, it was my second year of, uh, in, in, in this program. And honestly, my education, this PhD, sort of uh, em empowered me, to be, on a, to be honest, you know, empowered me um, in, in knowing my rights or standing up uh, or fighting to justice, uh, for justice and defending myself or standing up to myself. So sort of like not only education, but also empowerment. Um, my career in the U.S., um, I worked at Kennesaw State University as a TA. Um, then I um, moved to Columbia, Missouri in 2013, where I was engaged to my lady, um, who's my wife now. Um, she was doing her medical school in, um, at, at the University of Missouri, Columbia. And I started working at the University of Missouri, Columbia at the Department of Peace Studies. Um, 2017, 18, I moved back to, we actually, she finished her residency there and we decided to relocate. So we, we, we came back. So sort of the cycle um, kept going on and on until we came back to um, Youngstown where I started teaching some um, classes uh, at the School of Peace and Conflict Studies at Kent State University and also um, I've taught some classes for um, at the um, West, at Westminster College in New Wilmington, uh, PA. Now, as I mentioned, that's actually that's that's my, let's say this is sort of speaking about the family or my family in the U.S. Um, my wife, she's a physician, um, and, and they will speak about her experience in, in a minute. Uh, we have three kids, uh, five year old, two years old, and um, five months. We enjoy hiking and uh, discovering national parks. So that was four months ago um, uh, at the uh, Glacier National Park. We went there hiking, and this was um, also in the uh, at the Yellowstone National Park um, hiking there. So. From these photos, you could tell that we love the outdoor. We enjoy the outdoor. We enjoy hike. We enjoy hiking. We try to get sometimes because we are so busy with family and work. We get like peace of mind. We try to travel or to go outside. Uh, we decided back in the I believe 2014 because my family here. So when we come, I liked a place. It's called Kendall, PA, uh, where we purchased a camp there that 
every time we visit my family here, we go to the camp for a weekend. And after we moved here, we would go uh, probably a weekend every month to just get the peace of mind there and enjoy our, our family time. Um, and then the story begins. Now we are sort of transforming um, to the personal experience because you know most of these things happen to us. So I was talking to my wife the other day when you know about my presentation. I, I, here's the thing: we are a small family. You know, she comes from work. Uh, sometimes we, most of the time, we sit on the dinner table discuss. Um, our days, basically uh, asking my oldest son, how was, I mean, he's five year old, how was, uh, how was your day? I'm asking my wife, how was your day? Tell me about your day. And she asked me the same thing. Sometimes she comes home sort of like sad and, and, and laughing at the same time, just, and, and one day I asked her, so what's going on? She said, it is. It was a tough like day. I mean, I've had a very, very rough day. I said, what's going on? You know, she's an invincible woman. She's a veiled lady. She works at, uh, let's say, uh, a male dominant uh, institution, to be honest. Um, and she's veiled. Uh, so her experience is not quite easy. One day came, she said, you know, I, I entered this room to uh, help this patient who literally told me, I don't want a foreign Muslim doctor. Um, where did you even get or go to school? Um, anyway, so that's like basically here, I'm quoting some of the hate speech that we experience as a family. Um, then the other one, if you look at the other quotes, um, one day she called me, she was like, I said, there is something wrong, what's going on? She said, uh, just, she, she's, she, she wasn't happy, but she was laughing. She was like, I entered the room to help that lady. And uh, she said, she looked at me like this and she asked me how his eyes is doing. Um, have you said hi to them lately? You know, it's it sometimes like sound funny, but honestly, when you are the target, when you are a target of, of these hate speech, or comments or remarks, it harms, it harms a lot. It makes you feel that you don't belong to this society. You are being pushed away from that society and the political or the current political climate that we have. Um, so that's, that's, and actually that here she is. Um, when actually she's doing this picture was this week, she's treating COVID-19 patients at um, her institution. Um, so I asked her to share this uh, photo and she said, yes, um, do so please. Um, now that's, that's my experience. I've listed multiple incidents here and it's sort of like eerie or whimsical if you look at them, mostly in Ohio and PA. So I've lived in, in Georgia, I've lived in, in uh, uh, Missouri, also um, uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania. I lived in those four um, like states and I've traveled over 40 states, but they, these incidents basically happened in um, those two states. Um, let me go through each one as we go in a different slide or separate slides. In 2009, basically, um, I, I still remember that. A guy was shouting and yelling at us. So basically, uh, it, I, I, I've been here or had been here for two months only or less. And I went with my brother to one of the places he was trying to park his car. He was very close to the yellow line. So he was not, my brother was not parking like probably, but he did not mean it. But his car is still inside the, let's say the, was touching the yellow line. And in the car next to us, a guy, an older car, guy came with his either wife or girlfriend came down from his car and they still remember that like in front of my eyes, that's what's happening now. He started shouting and yelling at us, go back to your effing country. Um, if, if you don't know how to park, 
your car, you need to go back to your African country and learn. Um, I have just arrived like a month or so, or a month or so. Um, so he went, he went from zero to a hundred in seconds in a matter of like on a split second. I, I could not say anything. I mean, it's just, it was tough. It, it was tough to be honest. Uh, I mean, you know, I started connecting dots. Now in that, that's the racism, that's the discrimination that I read about when I was in the fifth grade when I read the history, um, the US history book. So it's sort of like maybe connecting um, the dots. My word stumbled in my mouth and did not say anything. I was scared. I, I honestly was scared to death. Um, this was a lesson that that, that was an, a, a value, invaluable lesson to me because a lot of people was, I mean, we're walking around us coming from even the store or going out from the store, leaving the store. None of them had stopped to say anything or stand. They just like were looking at us and, and none of them said anything. None of them maybe helped or intervened or say anything. They were just looking at us. I don't know why, but that's actually what happened. In 2011, I was working uh, uh, for a retail store, a clothing store, and a store in Newcastle, PA. Um, and I still remember that. Um, uh, a guy who purchased a pants from the store um, came back um, after he had worn it for, let's say for, I, I would say a week or so, it was full of dirt, he like brought it back. And according to the store return policy, uh, it could not be returned because it's, it's already worn and uh, dirty. I mean, I, I could not, it's not something that I put was the store return policy. So I told him, I can't accept that. This is our return policy. He started shouting and yelling at me. And exactly that's what he said, go back to your camel sand nigger, you stupid terrorist. That was literally, he was standing on the door. So I asked him to uh, leave or I would call the police. Then I called the police for him, but he left. That also was a wake up call. That was a wake up call for me. Why would someone hate like this? Why would you call me such slurs or racial slurs like this? And why would you label or stereotype me? Is it because of... Also, I, I, I connected the dots, you know. Now, I was closer from getting my or getting to my PhD program, which I mentioned. In um, 2018, Wilmington, PA, I was after leaving um, school, uh, finished my work. I wanted to, I went to one of the stores to purchase some of the, um, like just uh, to run some rings. Um, I was talking to a guy for maybe 10, 15 minutes, a nice conversation. I mean, I started a nice conversation. Uh, he was a middle-aged man. Um, he literally asked me, what do you do at Westminster? I told him I teach um, some courses about uh, um, uh, sports violence, minority majority relations and tourism. He replied uh, with a smile and I know the way his reply was is not like, is sort of stereotyping. He said, I think you are the right person to teach this topic referring to terrorism. So I asked him, now, why would you say that, like, why do you think I'm the right person to teach this topic? Is it because of my education or what? So he started like to stumble. He, he did not know what to say. He did not think that I would maybe defend or stand up to myself or say anything or maybe I start myself back. But that was, and the, 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 the conversation continued and, but I, I felt um, his apologizing was, was sort of insincere, but at least he, he apologized. Um, in 2019, which is a recent case, uh, this shirt I purchased, actually my wife got it as a gift for me in, uh, in my birthday in 2017. And this was when Islamophobia was on rise. And uh, 
uh, Trump banned a lot of Muslim countries or people from Muslim countries to come to the US and um, hate speech was uh, like on rise around. So it was sort of like raising because she know that I, I feel proud of my identity and I all the time speak about my identity. I am American. I mean, being American does not interfere with, with being um, Muslim. So they both does not interfere or do not interfere. A random question from a guy who was working out next to me in one machine. He literally asked me from nowhere, from like out of the get go. He said, how hard is it to get a citizenship here? I don't know how he assumed that because my shirt says like this. I mean, there are a lot of, of Muslim PhDs or doctors or even with no, um, um, let's say, or not graduates or, or any school experience uh, were born here in the US. So, so for me, it was a random question and we had like a, a long conversation as so, well. Um, that was an incident. Um, now, that's here's the, the, the most or the critical, the, the dangerous one, the most violent one. And I honestly, you know, it, every time that I present or participate in any conference, I have no problem um, speaking and, and I have no problem putting together uh, my PowerPoint or my experience into words. But honestly, it, when I was like literally writing and thinking about this, it sort of like brings me back those dark memories from that man who shot at my family. So the, the panic, say the, the, the stress, the anxiety come back, um, I feel like just sweating, so do not blame me, please, if, if anything happened. But what happened is in 2019, as I mentioned, we had a camp in, in Kendrill, PA. So um, we go every, I mean, we go a weekend. We take a weekend there every month. And um, uh, even if a family visits from outside the US or out the state, uh, we take them there to enjoy and relax. And I still remember that one day that um, we were enjoying our time there. Um, a family, friends visited us from, um, came from, uh, from Dubai. So we decided to go there and have fun to enjoy a weekend. Um, and, uh, you know, we, every time we go there, we usually go to the bike trail. Just we go down, walk there and be close or walk along the river. That day with five kids and four adults, we went, went down to took a walk on the trail along uh, the river. When an older guy, older white guy driving his golf cart, golf cart passed us and kept going back and forth, uh, passing us and looking at us. There was a wooden stairs goes, I mean, go down to uh, the river. We took it just to go to the side of the river. Um, he stopped and said, this is a private property and you need to leave now. Um, I personally said, and I know two or three at least of my um, company said, we are sorry, we did not know that uh, because there were no sign to say no trespassing or private property or anything like this. So we went back to the trail um, and we were going back toward the park, toward where we parked our car. And he was waiting next to our car, um, speaking to an older couple who also lived in that area. We were, they were like standing like in front of their house. Uh, their house were closer from the trail and from the parking lot. Um, we passed them. We all said hi with a smile. He looked, literally, he looked at us and said, you need to leave the trail and now and not to come back here again. I don't want to see you here. Now, here's the thing. I mean, it, it did not get serious so far. Um, now I have all this education. I've been learning about how to stand to yourself, to assert yourself. And I believe my, I'm an expert 
uh, to maybe defend myself or stand up to myself and how to defend my family or defend myself, like speaking, because I believe that like words are stronger than bullets. So I started speaking to him. I told him, why do you want us to leave and not to come back to this jail? Since it's a public jail, it's a public property. He said, you need to leave or I will kill and bury all of you in this river or in the river, as I'm quoting him here. And that's just only one like quote from him. So I reasserted myself again. Um, you have no right, I told him, as I told him, you have no right to ask us to leave a public property and not to come back to it. Um, then he started like uh, mocking uh, my accent and the way we, I mean, he believed that we pray um, using racial slurs such as terrorist, um, camel jacks, something like this. Um, and then um, the problem, you know, he was, Till this moment, he was stopping, or I mean, he was standing next to the older couple who did not see, I mean, say, and like even a word. He, they did not even intervene or say, there is no need for all of that. Older couple was just, I mean, I, I believe, I, I don't know why. I, I still like, I'm still trying, like when I started like to think about it, I don't, I don't know why we, I mean, they did not um, say anything. Um, I asserted myself and kept looking um, him in the eyes uh, when he said, uh, where is my gun? And he went back to his golf court searching for his gun. So now it, I, I felt so, it's, it's, it's serious and we are in danger. So I asked all my family members to go to their cars and I started dialing 911. He did not seem to find his, his gun in his cart. Um, so let me show you a video because we were actually trying to um, record a video for him. That's so that's actually when he said, where is my gun? And started um, or took off here. I have to take a You're so close to me. Yeah, yeah. Bring, bring the police stuff. Yes. All right. What you happened? You have trespassed. All, all I want to do is know You happened. have trespassed. Uh, Rocky. I'll be back. I'll be right back. So if you, if you guys um, heard that, he said, I will be right back. I will be right back. That's when he took off after searching for his, um, for his gun. Um, two minutes later, he came back. Um, for me, honestly, I thought he left. He was not serious. He left because I was on the phone with 911 um, and he was scared. But two minutes later, um, he came back from like um, just driving down the hill and he said um, he was like shouting and yelling racial slurs and parked his cart in front of us like not even a 50 yard from us, pulled his gun, pointed at us and shot, started shooting over our heads. He shot twice. Um, everyone panicked. Everyone panicked. Kids started screaming and running in every direction. Um, we did not know what to do. Some went to the trees, some went to the cobbles house, some went behind the car. Then after firing, a guy came in and like held him. So we all gathered and jumped into our car and we drove away. After, um, so while we were driving away from from the scene, we were like speeding. A police car was rushing to the scene. We waved to that police car um, because we believed it just was a mile or less from the scene uh, to stop this police car because we believed it's, it was coming um, to rescue us. Um, a police officer actually went down and started talking to us um, and he started writing um, the report after writing down all the report. Um, actually, uh, 
four other police cars arrived at the same moment. This police officer, um, like, uh, was, I mean, stayed with us, and the other four cars, police cars, went down to the scene looking and searching for him. Um, after writing down the, the report from the police officer, he asked me to ride with him to go down to the scene um, just to confirm and everything should be taken on the, um, um, like we do taped on the police cam. On the way, um, the first police car was coming from the scene and they stopped next to each other. So they were speaking to each other. I'm next to this police officer riding in the front seat. Um, the other guy, the other police officer in the other car said, you know, we, we had him and he's with us. He admitted, I just want to make sure to confirm if he was the right guy. So he opened his back window and asked me to look at this man and confirm if he was the same man. He actually shot us, shot us. Uh, before I say, and I saw him, before I say anything, he literally said, yes, it was me. As I told you, it was me. As if he was still admitting, I did not like um, regret uh, what he did. Um, he went to jail. Um, uh, we know that um, a, a pond of $25,000 cash was put on him. Um, as a family, we went back to our camp. Uh, we backed up and left. Uh, we went back home. So as I mentioned, he admitted firing. And let me just show you, here's the family on the trail. That's the family and this is the same trail. Uh, we, we had uh, the experience at, um, so he admitted, as I mentioned, on firing and saying everything. Um, few months or several months uh, earlier, this 2020 year, um, I was advised, because it was the sentencing, I was advised to attend and go to the court. Um, I went with my nephew and I gave a victim impact statement. I, I started with saying, uh, his name is, is Mark. He was there, a lot of people were um, in, in the um, court. So I told him, Mr. Mark, I just want to let you know that what you have done to us is heavy and we have been struggling with it. Um, the emotional trauma, uh, like the emotional trauma that you caused to us um, is unbearable. Um, yet, I just want also to let you know that we forgive you and we have no grudge against you whatsoever. It, it was not an easy decision. It was not an easy decision uh, for me and, and my family to forgive this man. I mean, a man who tried probably to kill us, uh, it is, it's not an easy thing. But I mean, as I mentioned, you know, um, I, I teach nonviolence and forgiveness. I, I teach conflict resolution. I teach nonviolence. And if I can do it, and forgive others who can do it? How can I expect it from others, other people to, to maybe forgive? So he was sentenced to um, a minimum of nine months um, to a maximum of 20, 24 months um, at home prison. And we actually put like, literally after this instance, we put this um, camp um, in, the, uh, in the market for sale and we sold it several months ago. This summer we sold it like in July. So we, um, we, we could not just go back there since um, the incident. Now, as I mentioned, uh, forgiveness, and I was literally talking to Wem um, before, before that, it's it's not easy. It's it's not easy to forgive. But you know, as a person who teach this, I need to practice what I preach. I need to practice what I preach. Um, and you know, just telling him, I want to let you know that um, uh, we forgive you and we have no grudge against you was not an easy thing. Um, was hard and tough. Uh, 
the, the process of, of healing, honestly, getting back, getting back to normal is absolutely difficult. I, I would be lying if I say that I am fully recovered from this trauma. Uh, as we know, and he visited me in, in this, um, to my home, to my house. I live in the country um, in Ohio where, the, where I see Confederate flag run, flags run very high. I see them on tracks. I, I, I still see a lot of older people or see looks from older people here that are similar, that are similar to the one that Mr. Mark or the, this guy uh, gave me when he told us that he will bury all of us in, in the river. And just to go back, um, if you guys can tell, he is wearing a Trump Make America, uh, make America, America great again, uh, um, Trump's hat. So uh, one thing that I just want to mention here, he, he, that's absolutely a right, like a friend, right wing or right tourism. It's, it's an ethno-nationalistic, let's say lone wolf um, tourism happened um, uh, to me, uh, to, to our family. But there are a lot of, the, I, as I mentioned, I live in, in, the, in, the, in the country. I have neighbors who are Trump supporters. They love me. They call me brother. They actually help me cope with um, this incident. They actually supported me with this. So, but this guy was the extreme right. This guy was the, the extreme right, if, if I will. Um, yeah, I just want to like I, I just wanted to mention uh, this this point. Uh, so we did we did counseling, and honestly, it helped us. Um, but what helped us more was the family support system and the or friend support system. Uh, when here, uh, even if I say thank you every single day that I will not, that will not be enough. For example, he wrote a letter to the Venango court and addressed, I mean, the judge and addressed um, the whole situation and demanded justice for me uh, as a person. A lot of my friends, also my colleagues shared my story and um, called me and, and talked to me and, and, and offered help and they stood up like with me, they supported me. I just, so what Wim and other friends actually did for me, basically left my soul when it was falling. It, it injected courage and love in my heart when my heart was aching and charged my, actually charged and, and boosted my morale when, when the world became dark in front of of my eyes or before my eyes. So as I mentioned, if, if I say thank you every single day, that would not be enough for Wim and other friends. Um, and trust tr trust me, um, you know, standing or take it, take it from a person who actually experienced a heavy trauma and emotional distress as an ethnic um, crime victim, standing up and supporting the underdog have a huge positive impact, have like basically a huge positive impact on them. Um, they would not forget um, your support. The support you provide during a difficult time will last forever with them. Now, these are, to be honest, as I mentioned, these are the scars that remain. I, I still sometimes fear and I feel anxiety and stress. Uh, we live in, in the country, as I mentioned, as a result of this incident, we, uh, we were thinking, I mean, I was thinking, I was talking to my wife, how can we, I mean, we immediately got, um, a security system and uh, 
Uh, we took all measures that could protect us. We would definitely, if we go to sleep, we lock all um, um, doors or entrance to our house. We lock our windows. We don't even let our kids play alone outside. It, it might be extreme to some, maybe a few or to some other people, but when you are a victim of a crime, that's what happens to you. And I just wanna mention for me personally, here's, here's my thoughts on prison. I, I don't think that um, prison will purify this man's heart or this guy's heart, Mr. Mark will not be, I mean, his heart will not be purified from hate or racism. In fact, because he's jailed um, for a mistake or for thing he did, um, hate might increase in his heart. Um, someone might say, you know, this type of people should be imprisoned and stay locked behind bars, but still, this will not change their minds. Their ideologies will not be changed because of prison. They will still hate you. They will not tolerate you. When they come out, they will definitely hate you and they might do something for you or against you or harm you in a way that as much, I mean, if, if they can't do it in a way that they will not be discovered, they would do it. So, I, I wished that the restorative, I mean, um, restorative justice system or program was more active, um, or at least they allowed victims and offenders um, to sit together, um, maybe discuss the emotional um, component and the emotional distress. I wish there was a program where I can have a dialogue with this guy. I would not even mind inviting him to my house for a dinner and speak to him because I am positive, 100% I can change his mindset about me, my family, my culture, and my entire society. He will not be, let's say, locked in his enclaved society. He will not because he will discover a new world. He will look at us using different lenses. He will see different perspectives. Again, um, that's, that's how I look at it. That's what I believe in. Um, you know, it, we, you want to present them, put them in prison, put them in prison, but probably activating programs where victims and offenders meet and discuss emotional trauma and discuss the impact of the crime has, has a huge, speaks volumes, has huge impact on both sides. Um, the last thing I just wanna say, you know, whether um, seeable or not, visible or not, all victims uh, bear scars. Um, that's true, the two shots he fired above our heads um, did not physically harm us, they did not touch us, they did not reach us, but they penetrated our hearts, our souls, and made our emotion or emotions bleed. Um, and I would like to conclude with, with two lessons that I've learned through all that experience all over this, this sort of decades and these hate incidents that I've experienced. Being bystander, you can make a difference. You can make a difference. You are expected to stand up, to do something, to say something. You cannot stay silent because if you stay silent, you are taking the side of the oppressor. The second thing is the friend or friend support system has an impact or give an everlasting impact or give everlasting courage and, and, and the bravery for, for victims. Um, that's, that's my presentation for today. And that's my uh, oldest son asking you if you 
have any questions for his daddy. Thank you so much. Jamil, it's just so compelling to me to hear you describe in such frank detail the dots you've connected from what I think our field calls microaggressions of comments that clearly indicate that people don't think you belong here and how that elevates into an action that literally terrorizes your family and leaves you with the inability to enjoy your family's happy place. And then at the same time to hear you say that you feel compelled that if you had the chance to dialogue with him, that not only would you, but that you would feel commanded to in order to change him because the system is not um, taking steps to change structures and reform behaviors. And um, so I just have to say th thank you. Thank you for taking on the task. I know it's painful. And I, um, I, I, I want to say to the rest of the participants, um, I know this man's heart and I know he wants you to speak from yours and ask questions. Um, so I'll just go ahead and get it started. Um, Jamil, you gave two, two really important lessons. Um, one about m moving from disengaged bystanders to engaged upstanders that when we see something, we can say something. Um, and that we can be supportive to our, our friends and families and colleagues. Um, my question is, you, you've given me great credit, but you don't need to thank me at all for writing a letter that um, said what I think the court needed to hear about just how incredible you and your family are and how much of a travesty it is to think that good people like you would be um, victimized in such a way. But that said, I really wasn't sure what to do. I remember, um, and you probably also remember, that I wanted to reach out to you and ask, was it okay? Because somehow I was also sensitive that I didn't want to co-opt your story or draw more attention to you. And, and I do think that even despite decades of training and expertise, I still have that feeling when I see stuff with strangers and when I see stuff with friends, I'm afraid if I get involved, even with the best intentions, I could potentially make things worse. And now that you have experience, I know on both sides of that, what would be your advice? Like, would it be something along the lines of just that simply ask the person if they want your help? Or would you actually say when you see something, you don't have to ask for help because the person really does need it. And you should always support people, even if they're strangers. What advice would you give there? Well, let me give this advice based, based on my experience. I absolutely would have appreciated um, if the older couple who were talking to this um, older guy, to Mr. Mark, intervened and um, just supported me or stopped this guy from saying things without asking, even asking my permission, because he seemed to be an aggressor. He, I mean, you could tell sometimes a person is being an aggressor, a person is being an aggressive person. Um, for me personally, based on my experience, I would not like ask the other person, if you want my help, based 
probably some some other people could I mean prefer th this approach, but my personal experience I would have appreciated someone to come in and um, let's say intervened without even asking me for my permission. Ellen, you posted a comment. I don't know if you'd like to um, actually share that. I, I would like to jump in on something, if I may. I didn't want to cut somebody else off, but Wim, is that all right? OK. Um, Jamil, you were talking about um, that thing, the idea, I and mean, you just, both of you were talking about that idea of the bystander versus the upstander. And I just wanted to let everybody know, and some of you may have heard of this group, it's called the Interfaith Youth Corps, IFYC, and it started by Ibu Patel. And they've started, and I don't know where they're at it, with it, but they were starting a program to bring to different colleges that they're calling upstander training. Right, and Interfaith Youth Corps fo focuses on religion and how that's often used, you know, and in your case, it's, you know, a combination of things, you know, but it's some good training and it's, you know, being trained to respond is an important thing and, and to, you know, you've done a lot of work and I admire your comments where you said you, you do forgive and that's an important thing. So two things, one was the IFYC, the second thing, when you were saying that you would have them to your to your house, um, again, that's comment that that's a comment on who you are, and you're having gone through and thinking about you know how to process this stuff, and it is difficult, and it's like you said, it's very difficult. We talk about in Hinduism and Buddhism, we talk about non attachment, and I tell my students if you can do that and then love the other person. But to actually do it is really hard. The one question I would ask you is you said you would do it so, and then that you could change his mind. And I wonder, can we do that? I mean, I think if we love each other or love a person, that's all I can do. I can't change your mind, I don't think. I can provide you with that opportunity. I can reach out to you for that and try to make that connection. But there are times I have tried and it hasn't worked. And I thought, you know what? I don't have control over that. I can only control me, which is hard enough. I mean, for you to even say you'd be willing to have them come into your house, there are people that I'm like, there's no way. I'm not at that point yet, because it takes a lot. But I would just ask you, what do you think about what I just said about the changing? Well, th thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alin. Two things before we like getting to changing the, the, the person mind, which is uh, like uh, an excellent point. The um, I, I mean, I FYC actually, I uh, worked with them. I was Kennesaw State uh, representative with them and they created the interfaith dialogue at the University of Missouri Columbia with their help for, for students organization. I was also, and I'm still the advisor because I still teach online with them some courses. Um, they do like brilliant work. I've honestly, I I um, I admit that I have not been in contact with them for say the last two years because after we moved, like I saw like personal or team person at the University of Missouri, so that I you know say um, direct communication or consistent communication with the um, IFYC um, has stopped. For changing, um, for changing someone's mind or cognitive, that's, I, I think it's, I shouldn't have said like completely change that person's mind. Uh, but what I believe I could bring about change. I, I believe that sharing food, speaking about my personal life, bringing that person to my life even under um you know like under the let's say the presence of, of security forces or something or a person that you know um come for just security to sit with us for the first and second time third time probably 
having or based on the contact hypothesis or the contact uh, theory as we call it sometimes, you know, just um, probably if not changing a lot or bringing a lot about, about bringing, uh, let's say a huge change, at least mitigating or reducing the, uh, the stereotypes, the negative image that this person maybe has just basically or simply about me as a person or about a person in my features. So I, again, uh, maybe mentioning like changing his mind in general is, is absolutely tough and hard. And one incident that I just wanna like share with you, I, uh, 2016, I was teaching introduction to peace studies at the University of Columbia, Missouri. And um, I would get like students, you know, because there were some students running this organization and they asked my help all the time. Uh, one of my students approached me after we finished the course and, this, and she said, you know, um, Dr. Wukian, I just wanna like thank you for a great semester. I just wanna tell you one thing. Um, I came from a very conservative family that when we, in the suburb, in the middle of nowhere in Missouri, when we sit on the dinner table, especially Thanksgiving dinner table, my parents and my grand grandparents speak. We don't intervene, we don't say anything. And this Thanksgiving, because of your class, they were speaking about Syrian refugees and they were speaking about racism and they're speaking about ethnic minorities and uh, white and, and, and uh, this political climate. She said, I stood up, I used some evidence, things that I've learned in your class. And literally I'm quoting her here, what she said, she said, my dad my father looked at me and he said oh god i sent my kids my conservative kids to school and i pay money and they come to me liberal thinking like this and that happened because of your class what i've learned here and she, then she actually um, did a similar interfaith, not an interfaith organization, sort of like intercultural or something or student organization. And she asked me to be the advisor of this organization, um, which you know brought me a lot of, of, of happiness, to be honest. Um, that that wasn't an, an example that you know an actual example that I felt the fruit of, of my work back then. And it's for sure that it's your engaging her and engaging your students and creating that bond and relationship that does bring about transformative change. So yeah, that is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just wanted to jump in, maybe piggybacking off of that. And what got me thinking this was talking about how, you know, your neighbors, you know, conservative, Trump-supporting neighbors, you know, nevertheless, are, you know, very strongly support you as well, have your back. And I remember sitting here thinking that I'm wondering how transferable is that and how much of that gets sort of quarantined, so to speak, is being written off as the one of the good ones phenomenon, where oh, he's one of the good ones, so they can change how they think about you while bracketing off changing how they think about other things. And I was wondering, what are your thoughts on that? Do you, do you think that it's having a more transferable effect? Do you think that maybe it shifts how they think about you, but not necessarily that that's being transferred or somewhere in between? So, that's absolutely an excellent question. I, I, you know, I have a, a, like basically almost daily communication with my, with my neighbor, like my next door neighbor. He's 
he's a wonderful man. He's uh, he's a Trump supporter. Um, he offered a lot of help when when I was in this difficult time. And my kids like sometimes go play with his kids. And uh, um, I remember sometimes like we would speak about our affiliation or um, what we believe in and and. Um, he literally multiple times mentioned that to me, you know, I, I have never had um, friends or neighbors or people that I speak to from like your religion, say Muslims um, or from your culture, um, telling me a lot about your background, your actions, your deeds, tell me that, you know, you are a wonderful man and you uh, you are uh, an excellent man, maybe. Uh, but the point is, that's what I'm trying to make. I'm, I don't know if it's because only it's only me or others, honestly. Probably because of something that I did, because I, I believe in sharing food, I, I believe in sharing personal stories, I believe in um, maybe um, just getting out of my comfort zone and speak to other people, probably break, let's say, or dow, I mean, break down or damage the wall between us. Yet, I'm, I'm not sure if, if you know, was sort of like if they um, or this could change their attitudes uh, about, let's say, people from other minorities or uh, people from different other cultures or, or um, colors, uh, races, etc. So that's how I, I, I look at it. I don't know, but that's how I see it. Um, I, uh, I had a similar question with regards to that because I thought listening to your story that the big story that was great for all of us was the courage in believing or accepting the support from the Trump supporters. Um, I wonder was there a need for forgiveness or it, uh, it in the way that it's difficult for a lot of people that don't support Trump to even uh, think they believe that people that support Trump oftentimes are um, supporting Trump. They're supporting racism, even though they're not, they say they still have friends that are. Um, anytime you're a bystander and you don't stand up to it or say something about it, um, you're still supporting it. And I'm wondering, uh, in your forgiveness, was there a component in the trust of your neighbor's intent? Um, yeah, it was the extremists that did it, but it still wasn't, um, they still support an extremist in office. Um, supporting them is being with them, isn't it? Um, I wonder if to me, it would be a great show if you could, you and your friend, and he could stand with you denouncing racism as a Trump supporter. There's one thing to say, um, just support the perpetrator and then just have condolences for your pain after your victimization. But he didn't say, is he saying anything to them? You said that the two lessons you had were the bystander, get up and say something. And that's my basic question. How is this forgiveness with your friend in that, do you feel like he's saying something to the Trump supporters? So to be honest, we did not take, let's say the conversation like that far to speak about um, like if, if uh, whether he um, um, denounce uh, like Trump supporters or supporters, but uh, our sort of conversation was literally about that person. And um, um, 
he like was unhappy he was upset he was sad because this happened to a man he knows um uh, well now denouncing you know the action of an extremist um or i would say extremist around there was not like let's say the core of our conversation but denouncing that person was yes um yeah that's 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 basically you know um so his support his support was um was basically to me as a person that he knows as a friend as a neighbor um whether the other person is a trump supporter or not um and he offered a lot of help and he literally asked me to um like um because he knows that we live in the country he literally asked me to call him and he knows this place has been here for, for for a while before i even come to this place um to come to i mean to call him if i needed anything if i need anything or any incident or such incident happened to me um to call um him and he said he would um like physically be there within within minutes so yeah well that's that's exactly i mean that's what happened or the the, the conversation that we had right Abby, you posted that you had a question and I wanted to make sure um, if you still had it, that you got a chance to ask it. Sure. So I feel like I'm having trouble phrasing it in my head, but um, you talked about how a lot of the people who had issues with you or would use racial slurs or even the shooting were older white people. Um, and I feel like a lot of older white people right now, too, um, those tend to be the main people who support Trump. And Trump, he, since he's stopped um, cultural training and training on white privilege, that kind of thing, I guess what I'm asking is if he does get reelected, which is something I don't want to think about, but it is a possibility, um, do you think we'll be regressing in a sense? Um, so then there's going to be younger people who we normally narrate as liberal that become more conservative because we aren't having the policies we had set forward before? Well, to be honest, this is this is an excellent question and a great question. And, um, you know, thinking of free election um, or electing him um, to the office um, it is not an easy thing. Um, we have, we've done, I mean, we've had enough in, the, in these four years. So having other four years would be a lot. Uh, but what concerns me, to be honest, on the, like, let's say, if, for example, he wins, um, and I hope not, um, the, the, let's say, the um, racism and the um, encouragement of, of, let's say, racist um, around the country will continue and uh, uh, will grow and they will be uh, vigilant or will be will be uh, will will have no let's say cultural or norms or limitation but they will come up and um, do whatever they uh, think um, they want to do because they are being supported from the president of, of, of the the u.s for it on the other side of the flip side if, if for example, he um, loses the election. I am scared that, you know, it gets um, crazier for, for those who support him now probably would start like moving toward the right fringe or move to be sort of like more extremists. That's, that's how I look at it. That's that's how I believe in it. Thank you. You're welcome. So, so Jamil, let me follow up on Abby's question with the part where you did a great job of connecting those dots on your personal experiences. 
Um, but you didn't include some of the other things like that have come up with kind of the political discussion, um, like Muslim travel bans um, and how on the one hand, you have been experiencing these episodes under Obama's leadership, um, but some of the experiences you've had under Trump's leadership have been different. So to what extent would you say that what you're experiencing is a structural manifestation versus um, you were just targeted in a, you know, individual on individual event? So, you know, when I, 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 when, to be honest, when I put this presentation together, when I listed these incidents, um, some of them were, as, as you mentioned, under the Obama administration, um, and they were closed from the, um, let's say, 2008, the first time, like, a, a person or a, a person of color was, I mean, a, a, an African-American president came to the US, which is shocking to the um, or shocked this country to the core. Uh, probably these um, uh, these individuals or those people who actually uh, sort of, of I mean sort of used maybe hate a speech or remarks against as you're, you're correct, they might be individuals. Um, yet um, these, uh, I would suggest they were actually. Um, motivated by the loss of their say president now under uh, under uh, trump's administration it's sort of more of a structural thing they um they are empowered by their president they are empowered by a president who uh when he's giving a speech in his uh in one of his campaigns for example um he would ask uh just someone to bunch up another person in the face or making fun of a person because of the way he looks or a disabled person. So when you see a president who support these things, now, you know, I mean, that's like, and, and we belong, let's say, to the same identity. We share similar identity and I support that person. You know, I'm now empowered. And I see it as a structure, like a structural thing. I see it as something normal now. I, th I think it's, you know, it's acceptable to come out um, and say uh, things about African-Americans or say things about Muslims or say things about women. Um, so I would, it's, I would say it's more structured around, I mean, under the, the, um, the current administration. And, and I hope this, um, stops, which, you know, we will all pray for that. John Getz, you had posted a question. Would you like to um, ask Jamil or explain what you're curious about? Sure. I was just trying to visualize the, the moment in the courtroom when you uh, turned to the person who had attacked you and your family and forgave him. I'm wondering what, what if any reaction he had at that time? Uh, he, he was, honestly, he was speechless. The only thing he said, thank you. Um, he did not say anything else. He just said thank you, but I felt he was speechless. Um, and that's, so I, I would say his body also sort of spoke volumes, sort of like giving or he was shocked. He was, you know, he was embarrassed uh, in front of the, um, the audience there or the people who, who, who were present in, in, in the courtroom. So that's how I felt from his body language and his or the tone of his of him saying thank you. Um, so that's, that's, that's how I saw his action. Thank you. Thank so you. It may have had much more impact than was visible at the time or than you could have known about at the time. The thing is, you know, uh, we had, uh, 
his wife was was sick um, because she was um, I think she was a disabled um, lady and uh, and uh, he as mentioned also have like like uh, I think health issues so probably this I, I don't know if I, I you know I'm not trying to give him excuses here because the impression that he gave me uh, but um, I, I think played, played a role in, in giving um, or making or sort of uh, shaping his reaction, you know. Thank you. Thank you. We, we do have time for another question, if anybody's holding back. Um, I believe... Uh, Yazan Nahar raised the hand, and he's a friend of mine who actually was just admitted, I mean, accepted in, um, to, the, uh, to our program, to the International, uh, International Conflict Management Program at Kennesaw. I think he has a question, I believe so. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jamil, for sharing your experience. And uh, I'm, I'm really sorry about the horrible experience you went through uh, with your family and uh, with your friends. And uh, that lead us, like, for me, racism is contagious. So re-electing the current president uh, that will uh, 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 raise a big flag against minorities and Muslims in general in the United States. But my question is, uh, as a researcher, as a professor, as a mediator, how can we fight the Islamophobia in, in the United States? And uh, is it, do you think like as, as a Muslim uh, uh, society in the United States, can we do something against it or... Uh, uh, that's, that's, that, yeah. Sure. Yes, and nice seeing you here. Nice seeing familiar faces also in the audience. Thank you. Absolutely, I'm happy to be here. Um, well, and, and absolutely an excellent question. And I think, yes, it's it's our duty, it's our job as Muslims to fight Islamophobia. You know what I mean? We should not wait for another person to fight for us. It's, it's absolutely excellent. Their support is wanted, you know, for them being in our side is, I mean, makes a huge difference. But it's mainly and first it's our jobs and duties um i would say for the uh, like individual level i would say you and me and other people who are educated and people uh, you know just break your comfort zone do not stay in your comfort zone um, if you feel that you need to speak because here's the thing uh, as i mentioned it's contact theory there is something con called contact theory or contact hypothesis talk to the other person uh, maybe speak about yourself, speak about your country, speak about, you don't have to share anything about, about Islam. Basically, speak about yourself as a person. Try to encourage other person, I mean, other people to, to say, I mean, to uh, approach you. Uh, stay like a smiley person, you know, speak to everyone. Do not let this, has, I mean, make you hesitate or sort of uh, uh, um, unmotivated or discouraged or... Uh, to, to reach or to approach others. Um, on the upper level, I would say, uh, or the higher level, I would say more of community work. Um, I think our communities across uh, zip codes or across the country, we should do, um, or we should have greater involvement of, of programs that could uh, teach locals about Islam, about, uh, um, you know, the forgiveness in Islam, about, um, hospitality in Islam about, uh, uh, you know, about, for example, uh, uh, taking care of your neighbors. It doesn't matter if your neighbor is a Jew or a Christian or a Hindu or, or uh, any person. So there is no affiliation behind that. Just take care of your neighbor, share food with your neighbor. So I would say the individual level and the community level um, have a greater, let's say, role to play. And uh, we still have a long way to go, honestly. Jamil, I'm not gonna make the last comment. I'll make the second to last comment. Um, and so um, 
you can speak after me and then we'll stop our recording then. But um, I really would like to thank you for delivering exactly the kind of presentation um, we need about the challenges and complexities that are experienced in the experiences of victimization and the trauma of, um, you know, being targeted. Uh, I mean, it's, it's so hard on the one hand to ask you to say, what was your experience? What's the meaning? What should we learn from it? And at the same time, um, to broadcast it out into all of these other issues. Um, again, part of what we've looked for, uh, my colleagues Pushpa Iyer and Michelle Collins Sibley put together with our programming for this month, was really an effort to connect with the stories and the narratives in a way that maybe it doesn't answer all the questions, maybe it only asks the questions. And I think that you've just really given rich insight. I know um, like, it's just really helpful for me to have you tell me as the person who's gone through it, don't ask for per my, my permission before you speak up for me. Um, don't be afraid to do the right thing, um, you know? So that's just, it's immensely valuable. Thank you for delivering such just crucially important information and perspective on a polarized country where the marketing of hate and division and divisiveness is on center stage. And um, yeah, your friendship means everything to me. So thank you again. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Wim. Thank you for um, your kind words. Um, and uh, I would like to thank uh, each and every one of you. Um, I know you guys took time out of your family time. It's um, uh, night and probably it's time for family to enjoy it. But, you know, attending my presentation um, means a lot to me. I hope uh, you all enjoyed it. Um, and uh, Again, I'm so um, delighted and honored to be part of this, to present to you and share my personal experience with all of you. And I hope we all learn from each other.